NBA player Kareem Abdul-Jabbar shares why he converted to Islam. I was born Lul Sindor. Now I'm Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. The transition from Lou to Kareem was not merely a change in celebrity brand name, like Sean Combs to Puff Daddy to Diddy to P. Diddy, but a transformation of heart, mind, and soul. I used to be Lul Sindor, the pale reflection of what white America expected of me. Now I'm Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the manifestation of my African history, culture, and beliefs. For most people, converting from one religion to another is a private matter requiring intense scrutiny of one's conscience. But when you're famous, it becomes a public spectacle for one and all to debate. And when you convert to an unfamiliar or unpopular religion, it invites criticism of one's intelligence, patriotism, and sanity. I should know. Even though I became a Muslim more than 40 years ago, I'm still defending that choice. Unease with celebrity. I was introduced to Islam while I was a freshman at UCLA. Although I had already achieved a certain degree of national fame as a basketball player, I tried hard to keep my personal life private. Celebrity made me nervous and uncomfortable. I was still young, so I couldn't really articulate why I felt so shy of the spotlight. Over the next few years, I started to understand it better. Part of my restraint was the feeling that the person the public was celebrating wasn't the real me. Not only did I have the usual teenage angst of becoming a man, but I was also playing for one of the best college basketball teams in the country and trying to maintain my studies. Add to that the weight of being black in America in 1966 and 67, when James Meredith was ambushed while marching through Mississippi, the Black Panther Party was founded. Thurgood Marshall was appointed as the first African-American Supreme Court justice and a race riot in Detroit left 43 dead, 1,189 injured and more than 2,000 buildings destroyed. I came to realize that the Lou Olsen door everyone was cheering wasn't really the person they imagined. They wanted me to be the clean-cut example of racial equality. The poster boy for how anybody from any background, regardless of race, religion, or economic standing, could achieve the American dream. To them, I was the living proof that racism was a myth. I knew better. Being seven foot two and athletic got me there. Not a level playing field of equal opportunity. But I was also fighting a strict upbringing of trying to please those in authority. My father was a cop with a set of rules. I attended a Catholic school with priests and nuns with more rules, and I played basketball for coaches who had even more rules. Rebellion was not an option. Still, I was discontented. Growing up in the 1960s, I wasn't exposed to many black role models. I admired Martin Luther King Jr. for his selfless courage and shaft for kicking ass and getting the girl. Otherwise, the white public's consensus seemed to be that blacks weren't much good. They were either needy downtrodden folks who required white people's help to get the rights they were due or radical troublemakers wanting to take away white homes and jobs and daughters. The good ones were happy entertainers, either in show business or sports, who were expected to show gratitude for their good fortune. I knew this reality was somehow wrong, that something had to change. I just didn't know what it meant for me. Some fans took my decision very personally, as if I had firebombed their church while tearing up an American flag. Much of my early awakening came from reading the autobiography of Malcolm X as a freshman. I was riveted by Malcolm's story of how he came to realize that he was the victim of institutional racism that had imprisoned him long before he landed in an actual prison. That's exactly how I felt, imprisoned by an image of who I was supposed to be. The first thing he did was push aside the Baptist religion that his parents had brought him up in and study Islam. To him, Christianity was a foundation of the white culture responsible for enslaving blacks and supporting the racism that permeated society. His family was attacked by the Christianity-spouting Ku Klux Klan, and his home was burned by the KKK splinter group the Black Legion. Malcolm X's transformation from petty criminal to political leader inspired me to look more closely at my upbringing and forced me to think more deeply about my identity. Islam helped him find his true self and gave him the strength not only to face hostility from both blacks and whites but also to fight for social justice. I began to study the Quran, conviction and defiance. This decision set me on an irreversible course to spiritual fulfillment. But it definitely wasn't a smooth course. I made serious mistakes along the way. Then again, maybe the path isn't supposed to be smooth. Maybe it's supposed to be filled with obstacles and detours and false discoveries in order to challenge and hone one's beliefs. As Malcolm X said, 
I guess a man's entitled to make a fool of himself if he's ready to pay the cost. I paid the cost. As I said earlier, I was brought up to respect rules, and especially those who enforce the rules, such as teachers, preachers, and coaches. I'd always been an exceptional student, so when I wanted to know more about Islam, I found a teacher in Hamas Abdul Khalis. During my years playing with the Milwaukee Bucks, Hamas version of Islam was a joyous revelation. Then in 1971, when I was 24, I converted to Islam and became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, meaning the Noble One, Servant of the Almighty. The question I'm often asked is why I had to pick a religion so foreign to American culture and a name that was hard for people to pronounce. Some fans took it very personally, as if I had firebombed their church while tearing up an American flag. Actually, I was rejecting the religion that was foreign to my American culture and embracing one that was part of my black African heritage. An estimated 15 to 30 percent of slaves brought from Africa were Muslims. Fans thought I joined the Nation of Islam, an American Islamic movement founded in Detroit in 1930. Although I was greatly influenced by Malcolm X, a leader in the Nation of Islam, I chose not to join because I wanted to focus more on the spiritual rather than political aspects. Eventually, Malcolm rejected the group right before three of its members assassinated him. My parents were not pleased by my conversion. Though they weren't strict Catholics, they had raised me to believe in Christianity as the gospel. But the more I studied history, the more disillusioned I became with the role of Christianity in subjugating my people. I knew, of course, that the Second Vatican Council in 1965 declared slavery an infamy that dishonored God and was a poison to society. But for me, it was too little, too late. The failure of the church to use its might and influence to stop slavery and instead to justify it as somehow connected to original sin made me angry. Papal bulls, dumb diverses, and Romanus Pontifex condoned enslaving native people and stealing their lands. And while I realized that many Christians risked their lives and families to fight slavery and that it would not have been ended without them, I found it hard to align myself with the cultural institutions that had turned a blind eye to such outrageous behavior in direct violation of their most sacred beliefs. Conversion is a risky business because it can result in losing family, friends, and community support.